This is what I'm going to talk about in terms of some high yield topics that have changed over the years, and I think that uh, in this group it, it's becoming more and more complicated managing stroke patients, and I'd like to cover the, the more interesting uh, aspects of it. And these are some class levels of evidence that are just referenced in the, in the talk. So I'm going to talk a little bit about case-based approach, and the first case is a 72-year-old man with uh, all the risk factors except a prior stroke. He has, heart, has hypertension, heart disease, and he was well when he got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom at 3 a.m. So his wife heard him get up in the middle of the night, and then at 6 a.m. he gets up and she hears a thud and falls to the side of the bed, and he's unable to move his right side and can't speak. She calls 911 and he comes to our ER. And in the ER he's got a dense left gaze and right facial droop. He's got right hemiplegia and there's no response to sensation on the right. His NIH stroke scale is 22. When we talk about NIH stroke scale, everyone in this room is a zero. If you've had a stroke that's so severe you're comatose, you're a 30. And that's about the range that we're talking about. So this is a pretty severe stroke of a 22. He arrives and we complete our exam at 6.30. And this is a CT. I expect pretty much anyone who, who manages uh, patients to be able to read a negative CT. And when we talk about a negative CT, we really mean that there's no blood on the CT. And if you see blood, it's going to be bright white. And this is just one example of something that can be bright white that's not blood, and that's a calcified falx in the midline of this brain. So that's not blood. But otherwise, this is a negative CT. What I don't necessarily expect everyone to recognize, but would be an A plus if you did, is a left MCA that's dense. So this shows a left MCA that's, that's not getting any flow because it's full of uh, clot. So the patient was up and about, heard well at 3 a.m. It's now 6.45 a.m. in the ER. Is the patient a candidate for TPA? Who votes yes? Selection season. Who votes no? It's four plus hours. So it turns out the answer is yes, TPA is indicated. We now have TPA in our window extended to four and a half hours. This is a revision of our guidelines, and it, did, it is important to know that the ECAS-3 trial, which led to this uh, change, did exclude some groups. So some of the patients who are over 80, those who had an NIH stroke scale that was very high, those with diabetes and prior stroke, that's important to know because of the trial. In clinical practice, we pretty much use the basic contraindications from the other studies. So you can leave those caveats out for, for the most part uh, and use the, the, the window for TPA now at four and a half hours. It turns out that the longer you wait, the less the benefit. So just keep in mind we still want to get these patients treated as fast as possible. So this patient gets TPA. It's now 6.55 in the morning. What are we going to do for the patient? This is a large left MCA occlusion. What's the likelihood that TPA is going to benefit this patient? About 10%. So about a 90% chance that all that study didn't do any good for this patient. So what are we going to do? Interventions, I heard somebody say. So this is what we call, we're now using the term ELVO. So you can either call it an emergency or just a large vessel occlusion, ELVO. This is basically the neurological equivalent of an ST elevation MI. The patient has a dense left MCA sign, large vessel occlusion, and there's a poor outcome. So we have different modalities to rapidly assess for this. The CT angio is shown in the upper left-hand side. This is the most commonly available, and you can see that cutoff on the left MCA. If a patient's in a center doing rapid MRIs, you may see a perfusion deficit, a cutoff on the MRA, or if you take the patient straight to angio, that's what it looks like in the lower right-hand side. So what is the evidence that we should go after these? Well, this is really the, the landmark studies of, of neurology and stroke neurology in the last uh, two years was that we had four studies, the Mr. Clean, Swift Prime, Escape, and Extend IA, all of which showed benefit for these patients above and beyond TPA in most cases. These are the data. I won't ask you to look at that except to know that uh, we now have a class one level A recommendation, which is really the gold standard recommendation for t sending these patients for interventional uh, clot retrieval. Uh, there are some points that you should know. The patients should still receive TPA. So just because they're within that window and you don't think it's going to work, you should still give TPA um, and then rapidly get the patients up to the angio suite as, as soon as can be. We also look for the patients that have a negative CT. In other words, their CT shouldn't show that they already have a stroke and certainly shouldn't show a bleed. So when we, if you all are working with patients in, in the cath lab or in the ER or in the ICUs, one of the things that we know is time is brain. 
The, the sooner you can recognize the deficits, the sooner you can get them uh, to the angio suite. We see so many patients having uh, complications because of delays. So we're looking at doing a better job just, uh, and you all can help with that as well. So this would be a patient you would not include. In other words, I said you should recognize a negative CT, you should also recognize a uh, catastrophic uh, stroke. So that, that, or a patient beyond 12 hours. And there's really a lot of controversy between six and 12 hours. So this is a different, uh, similar kind of case to the, to the CT I just showed. A 58-year-old man who comes in with left hemiplegia and a dense right gaze. Uh, he was okay at nine, but now he's coming in at six. And he has, a, again, a very high NIH stroke scale of 24, and this is his CT. Is this a negative CT? No, very large stroke. So in this case, is this a patient who's a candidate for TPA? No. Well beyond four and a half hours. Is it a candidate for thrombectomy? No. Is there anything we can do for this patient? This is what we call a malignant MCA. A malignant MCA means that the edema of the infarct is so bad that the patient will die. And uh, we need to do something about that. So we do hemicraniectomy. And you may think that hemicraniectomy, going in and taking out the, the skull, is uh, a pretty morbid procedure, and, and you or your family member would never want something like that. But it turns out that the, the results are actually far better than you might expect. We, can, we, we measure disability by a modified Rankin score, and what this means is that the patient was able to walk and manage most of all of their activities of daily living. So in patients who received craniectomy, close to half of the patients were able to walk and carry out their activities of daily living. That, compared to patients who didn't, doubled their chances. So again, recognizing a severe stroke early, recognizing it before the patient has blown pupils and is unsalvageable, uh, can lead to doubling their chances of a good outcome with he hemicraniectomy. There was, no, interestingly, you may say, okay, well, right MCA stroke, that's what this patient had, non-dominant hemisphere. We don't have to worry about language. It could be a good outcome. But there really was no difference between patients who had dominant and non-dominant hemisphere strokes. The real difference comes in age. So the patients who are over 60, they have a little bit more atrophy, they have less rehab potential, may or may not benefit. There's modest benefit. Patients under 60, they don't have much atrophy in their brain. They're going to die, and they do have a rehab potential. So age is really the more, most important thing here. So the next case is a 75-year-old woman who has heart failure and hypertension who comes in with an acute onset of a left homonymous hemianopsia. She's evaluated, and we do our typical stroke workup. So what is a typical stroke workup? MRA, telemetry, EKG, all those things, sinus rhythm. She says she occasionally has episodes of shortness of breath, even without exertion, and we send her home on aspirin, statin, and her own blood, blood pressure medications. Anything else we should do for this patient who has a negative workup and a other than a stroke? So yeah, cardiac monitoring. Everyone here is on board with that. So this is uh, for a cryptogenic stroke. Uh, it's an interesting literature that, that we're diving more and more into is that th there's a, if you look at this, this is the patients who they detected AFib on that slope. And what you'll see is that early on we probably detect patients who had AFib as the cause of their stroke, but then the slope becomes kind of linear. And so there may be something about just having a stroke and the same risk factors that about 10% per year we're detecting AFib in this patient population. And that was seen in, in more than one study. So it's not yet that gold standard level, class one level A recommendation. It remains somewhat controversial, but uh, it is a recommendation to consider. So what if you do find AFib? What about all these novel drugs? Uh, you all probably have as, as much expertise in this as we do. Uh, they're out there. They have, uh, originally they were kind of lumped in their recommendations. Now they're split. They may be lumped again eventually, but... Right now, they're only indicated in non-valvular AFib, and none are indicated in artificial valves. From a stroke specialist per perspective, we do like the novel drugs because they have a class effect of decreasing intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, and there's uh, no labeling or recommendations for other CNS diseases. So what if your patient happens to be on apixaban, rivaroxaban, dibigatran, and they come into the ER with a stroke? What do we do? And the patients will actually ask you about this in, their, in the clinic when you're deciding about these drugs. You know, there's nothing you could do for me if I had a stroke. Well, it turns out we do have recommendations. The basic recommendation is that we check, if we can, a 10A level, if it's a 10A drug, or an eccrine clotting time, if it's a direct thrombin inhibitor. 
But if we don't have those things, we really go by the patient's dose. And what we see on the stroke side is that compliance with medications almost never leads to stroke. It's almost always the patient that missed a dose or two. So if we can document that they missed a dose or two and they have essentially normal coags, they are okay for having a TPA, at least in our center. So the, keeping in mind the 10A drugs, there is monitoring now available. Uh, if you have a 10A that is calibrated for rivaroxaban, 10A that's calibrated for apixaban, uh, that, that's what you can use to see if your patient's responding. If you have that patient who's on the borderline of renal function, there is a reversal agent for dabigatran. The reversal agent for the 10A drugs uh, was postponed by the FDA and may be readdressed in a few months. Uh, they all have different degrees of renal metabolism, and every six month renal function is reasonable. One other thing I just want to point out is that uh, my colleagues at UT and I participated in the ARTS-2 trial. This is a trial that you don't have to remember, but I just want to tell you a little bit about it because what, they, what we did is we gave IV argatraban. So IV argatraban is basically dabigatran, it's a direct thrombin inhibitor, and we gave it to patients not only during their stroke, but for three days with TPA. Many of these patients were old and fragile. So this is the, it's kind of the worst case scenario that you worry about the patient on their, their drug and getting TPA. And we saw no increase in bleeds. So just as a quick aside, that, that the risk of bleeding when you combine TPA with these drugs is probably far less than we worry about. So the next case is a 45-year-old woman with diabetes who had an acute aphasia and right arm weakness. She gets TPA within two hours and makes a complete recovery. Prior to that event, she was on aspirin, insulin, and atorvastatin 20. This is her MRI and MRA. And she has a symptomatic 90 plus percent left MCA stenosis. She's recovered. What should we do about it? Any votes for stenting? Not stenting. The SAMPRIS trial was done to look at this exact patient population, patients who had high-grade stenosis and the intracranial circulation. And what we found was that medical management won. It won not only in the first 30 days, it won in the one-year follow-up, and it won in every subgroup that was looked at. So the, the, the pearl here is that the patient who's on maximal medical management will come to you and say, what else can be done? And the answer is maximal medical management. Even those who were already on it and had a stroke did better off staying on it than having an intracranial stent. So the next case is going to get us a little bit into um, a controversial area. This is a patient with a painless monocular vision loss, or amaurosis fugax. The MRI is negative, and the patient has a carotid Doppler showing a 50 to 69% stenosis on the ipsilateral side and 70 to 90% on the contralateral side. What's the best clinical approach? Well, we know that in symptomatic carotid stenosis, any stenosis greater than 50%, carotid endarterectomy is class one level A. What about stenting? So stenting was the CREST trial looking at endarterectomy versus stent, and these are the primary outcomes listed below. Endarterectomy and stent for the combined endpoint had equivalency. If you look only at stroke and death, that's what's in parentheses. Endarterectomy looked a little bit better because it had less stroke, and uh, carotid artery stenting looked a little bit better because it had less MI. There is an age effect. The point where they cross midline is at age 70, but just a reminder that there are error bars, and those error bars extend basically from age 50, or the lowest uh, age enrolled in the trial, up to age uh, about 85. So uh, keeping in mind that uh, although we think of age 70 as the cutoff between these two, that uh, it, it is individualized for the patient. And I will... Uh, leave with one last point about carotid stenting, and that's about asymptomatic carotid disease. We can all debate whether it's beneficial for patients to have stenting or surgery for asymptomatic carotid disease. The major point I'll make, though, is that we don't recommend any asymptomatic carotid interventions for patients who are at high risk of complications. So many of your patients who have severe coronary artery disease, risk of MI, are not good candidates for any carotid intervention that's asymptomatic. And thank you very much.